Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dealer's Choice, the role of ginseng dealers in conservation, a part of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Thank you so much for joining us. We are offering real-time captioning and American Sign Language interpretation for today's program, so to view the simulcast that includes these services, please use the link provided in the comment section. My name is Kate Farley, and I am a doctoral candidate in sociocultural anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis. And today, we invite you to participate in a conversation that explores the tradition of ginseng dealing in Appalachia and how ginseng traders play a role in conservation of this valuable native plant. Um, we'll, we'll be taking your comments in the live chat, so please participate. This event is sponsored by the Smithsonian Conservation Commons and Earth Optimism. And if you don't know about the Folklife Festival, I encourage you to check out festival.si.edu to learn more about our programs, education resources, and more. Um, now, before we get started, we would like to show a brief video tribute to Tony Hayes, an important member of the ginseng community who unfortunately has passed away recently. He was a longtime ginseng and other root buyer with an incredible wealth of knowledge, and we will miss him greatly. So you'll hear Tony's voice um, and see some photos of Tony talking about his very long career of working with ginseng. Just new people in the community, uh, old timers. Um, sometimes I get lucky and somebody would say, now so-and-so wants you to pick them up this time they've got something down, you know. I can remember before we had the internet, before we had all these lists published of dealers, for instance, when I first started expanding out and we went into West Virginia. They never run routes, so I started running routes in West Virginia. We're always here and we've always done this and they can't tell us what to do, you know. And uh, so that whole culture, there's a very, there's remnants of it left. And I think, to me, that's, I think, what your what the Smithsonian, what we're really historically more interested in than the root. It's the culture around there. It's oh, the social, yes, yeah, it's, it's the social anthropology, that, that, that element of it. And uh, probably ethnobotany, any ethnobotany around it would be far more valuable to us all than, than how much it's worth or whatever. And growing it's a great thing, and, and I love what we're doing and totally support it. And I've always supported growing ginseng because it takes pressure off of wild populations. It'll be up to her whether she and her brothers, whether this continues or not. It's set up to what could go on. Something happens to me. We're, we're not going to be fire selling anything if we're shutting down. And now I'd like to welcome our guests, Tony Kaufman from West Virginia, Sarah Jackson from North Carolina, and Chester Crane from Southwest Virginia. Um, now, please bear with us if our internet looks a little funky because we're all dealing with rural internet. So um, things might be a little pixelated, but we're gonna continue this conversation as best we can. Um, so first I'd like to ask each of our guests to introduce themselves and explain a little bit about what it is you do in the ginseng world. So let's start with Tony. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Tony Kaufman. I'm uh, located in West Virginia, central West Virginia. I've been a traditional ginseng buyer for 40 years. Uh, my family uh, would be their 90th anniversary in the ginseng uh, business. My grandfather is still here. Um, my role is to try to bring your ginseng that you've worked hard and harvest to get you the best price out of it. Uh, I'm also a gin signer as well uh, when I get an opportunity, but it's kind of tough when you're working six and seven days a week through the gin sign season. Uh, but it's uh, it's still a great thing, uh, a hobby to have, and I really enjoy it. Um, and uh, I look forward to serving you, uh, my uh, diggers, for years to come. I never plan to retire. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tony. Um, so let's move on to Chester. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chester Crane of Granny's Ginseng Farm here in Southwest Virginia. Uh, I get involved with teaching stewardship and practicing stewardship of our ginseng and our wild medicinal plants. Uh, I attend I attend events and give speeches on planting and stewardship and share a little bit of history about our ginseng and I. I uh, try to educate people on how we would like to have a uh, ginseng hunting tradition going on for hundreds of years to come. Uh, we, 
we provide plenty of seeds for people to plant. We try to get top quality seeds, visit farms and get top quality seeds and provide for the general public to plant. Uh, and we encourage everyone from of any age and any background to plant ginseng and secure our ginseng hunting future in Appalachia. Great. Thanks, Chester. Now, Sarah. Hello from Bat Cave. Thanks, Kate, by the way. And I think this is a, a great opportunity to talk about a really important subject. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm a forest steward and a ginseng advocate with a teeny tiny obsession <laughs> with wild American ginseng. Uh, my partner, Martin, and I own and operate Bat Cave Botanicals, which is in Bat Cave, North Carolina, uh, which is about an hour south of Asheville, North Carolina. My short little story is that I worked with ginseng as an herbalist long before I moved to Bat Cave. And Martin uh, pointed out the wild ginseng that was growing by our waterfall here on our property. Um, in that moment, just kind of looking at the living, growing plant, you know, years of personal study, medicine, culture, and history just kind of came together just with this one little plant, this pretty little plant that was in front of me. So uh, we decided to become North Carolina ginseng dealers to be able to market and sell our own ethically harvested roots to a specialty market in the United States. We didn't have our export license or anything. And, um, you know, while a business like that will never really compare to a traditional dealer's revenue, we were able to prove that it's possible to use ethical practices and still make a profit. So we've worked with the North Carolina Plant Protection Program, state park rangers, a local nature preserve, I'm sorry, reserve, and um, have been developing educational resources to promote good stewardship and ethical harvest. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, now, then my next question is primarily for Tony, but Chester and Sarah, if you'd like to chime in, feel free. But I was thinking it would be really great if you could just briefly walk us through what happens during a typical ginseng deal when a digger comes in with a load of ginseng to try to sell you. Just how does that go? Well, usually they call me first and get an idea about what the price is going for. Um, but with the internet today, they usually know pretty much what the market is. Um, but typically, uh, we come in and uh, it's not as much as a business transaction as it is seeing an old friend again from one year to the next. Uh, my customers, uh, they come back year after year uh, and they, we swap stories. And uh, uh, basically, I take a look in the bag and see how well they've done, how many big ones is in the bag, uh, make sure that uh, uh, it's cared for properly, washed correctly, uh, not burnt in an oven or something. I've seen it in microwaves. I've seen a lot of different things over the years. Um, once the quality is good, uh, there's not much to it other than uh, weighing it up uh, and getting their approval of the weight, which I suggest everybody weigh their ginseng before they take it in. Not that ginseng dealers are crooked, but sometimes we make mistakes or something. I have before. Look at the scale wrong and I've been corrected uh, by accident. Uh, but uh, then more or less, we just agree on a price and shake hands and uh, I'll see you next year. And good luck and goodbye. And um, can you just briefly explain to our audience here, what would be a typical price for wild American ginseng and about how many roots would go into like a pound? Well, the less roots per pound probably means more dollars per pound. Uh, the larger roots are worth more than the smaller. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> so you would take a, um, the, uh, a ginseng digger that has, uh, experience, uh, it was probably going to receive a little bit more than someone who just starting out uh, in the business because, well, they just don't, uh, they, for some reason, they look underneath the big ones, which will strike you about waist high, some taller, and they look too close to the ground and they find the babies, but they don't see the big ones. Uh, but the, uh, uh, as far as um, trying to uh, get the best gem sign, it, you really just, it's almost luck. I mean, you have to go where no one else goes and uh, find just the exact spot. You know, it's it's an art uh, mm -hmm. for the, the people to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And just to, just to clarify, in the picture that we were just looking at, that was a pile of 
um, tan colored ginseng roots that yeah. were on a metal tray um, next mm -hmm. to the scale on, on your shelf. Um, I, I'm yeah. looking at it. I am not sure if that is green or dry ginseng in that okay. pan. Uh, okay. To be honest, I can't really uh, spot. I would guess if it's dry, that's a nice bunch of ginseng. All if right. it's green, uh, that's about average. You see big ones in the way it should be, big, middle, and small. Uh, not so many on the small side, we hope, but you can help that. You can have a 20-year-old ginseng, and it won't be any larger than your little finger. So. All right. Great. Um, Chester and Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? Well, here, what we do here at our farm is we mostly have online orders, but when we do have someone to come come visit the farm and pick out plants to purchase, uh, we we take them for a little tour and show them our gardens and try to teach about where the best places to grow is. And one thing that we do that probably most ginseng dealers don't do is when people do visit the farm, we offer them something to eat. Great. Yeah. And Sarah? Hospitality there, Chester. Um, you know, I, I haven't really worked with a whole lot of um, root diggers because I've mainly been um, kind of like, I've, I've dug my own roots. We, we work with um, one other, um, you know, this, this amazing hunter who's been hunting for over 50 years and his whole family, you know, has done it before him. So, I mean, he does it the right way. He's an amazing steward. You know, he knows everything there is to know about the, the woods, about the forest. And so, um, you know, I, it's just me kind of doing it ethically and I dig my own roots and then sell them, um, market them. So, yeah, you know, I only get, I only selectively harvest the, um, you know, like the oldest plants in a whole population. And I try to take the whole population into account when I'm harvesting roots too. And of course, um, I'm slower than molasses <laughs> when it comes to digging as well, so. All right, and we have one more question just to clarify some of what we've just been talking about is, can you explain the difference between green and dried ginseng? Who's the question for? Any Anybody, uh, Tony, mm -hmm. why don't you go ahead and well, the green add. ginseng is fresh dug. That's mm -hmm. straight out of the woods. Uh, there is a market uh, for fresh ginseng, period, without drying it. Uh, we sell that to the Korean population here in the United States. Uh, the uh, dry market uh, predominantly goes to Asia, to Hong Kong, and where it's traded. Uh, so, uh, but like I say, the, the Asian people here in the States, as far as the Korean population goes, uh, they they wouldn't give you very much for a dry root, but they will pay dear money for a nice fresh root straight out of the woods. And, and in that image we were, we were just looking at, that was um, you, Tony, in your warehouse with a big brown barrel, presumably full of ginseng. Um, in big barrel about waist high. We can put together 20 barrels of ginseng in a season. Wow, that's quite a bit. Wow. Um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for clarifying that a little bit. Um, but next question um, is, how is the increasing scarcity of ginseng affecting your business? Um, this time, let's start with Sarah. I think I'll defer to the other gentlemen who probably have quite a bit more experience. All right. On that. All right. Chester? Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> Well, as far as the, the you know, gym sign is getting uh, rarer in the woods, uh, but also the diggers are getting rarer, too. It's a dying pastime right now. Uh, we had a TV show that came on a few years ago, Appalachian Outlaws. A lot of people in the gym sign industry knows what I'm talking about. They, uh, it actually brought it back some. Uh, they were a lot of people... Uh, that really got interested when ginseng hit four or five hundred dollars a pound in 97. That was probably the peak. And then it slowly went down, interest dropped in it. Uh, and they really dug a lot of the ginseng out back in the 90s, too. Late 90s, 2000, something like that. When ginseng hit five hundred dollars a pound for the first time, uh, people went crazy uh, because it was one hundred and fifty bucks and quadrupled in price in one year. Uh, they didn't know how the transference of Hong Kong back to China from Great Britain would affect the ginseng trade, so they were stockpiling it. Uh, 
but since the, after that, though, the price dropped after they stockpiled, and the interest in the plant dropped, and so did the amount of diggers. Uh, but then the show came back, and people dusted off their sign hose and got interested again. The show was fortunate enough that it came on when the gin sign was $1,000 a pound for the West Virginia, and about twelve, thirteen hundred for the Carolina route, the, the best of the route in the New York State, and uh, p renewed the interest in it. And folks like Chester, who uh, have farms and things, they sold a lot of seed, I'm sure. People started planting a lot of ginseng. Uh, so I actually think it may have helped uh, the population just by people planting it. Now, there's argument about genetics, uh, wild versus simulated wild, but I think it's all the same. I really do. I can take a, a wild ginseng plant that's in a poor soil that's not doing very well and take the berry from that plant, even if it's in red soil, and we wouldn't give a nickel for it if you dug it. I can take the berry off that very plant out in this, uh, North Carolina where Sarah is and take the berry and plant it there, and it'll grow a nice North Carolina-style root. Uh, so that's, uh, to me, that, you know, even planted what Chester and people like him who have the ginseng farm to provide the seed is an invaluable uh, asset to the ginseng industry right now. That's, that's what will keep ginseng from disappearing from the planet. Great. Now, it's interesting that you br brought up that TV show because it's been somewhat controversial in the, in the ginseng world because I think that a lot of people um, are worried that it's led to increased amounts of poaching. So can you can can you explain a little bit about how you deal with the problem of poaching um, well, in your role as a ginseng dealer or buyer? Well, I, I will not buy it uh, unethically. Uh, I do not mm -hmm. buy out of season. I don't buy roots that are not, uh, you know, like seedling roots. You can see them. They say, well, how do you know how old it is when the top's broken? Well, if it's the size of a piece of pencil lead, you shouldn't have dug it, you know, no matter how, I don't care if it's 20 years old, uh, but that's not true. I mean, you can tell a seedling plant, uh, anyone that's bought ginseng for 40 years can certainly tell something that's a baby. Um, for example, that's a nice root in that jar there. That's one of mine. Um, it's probably 75 or 80 years old. Uh, but how I deal with it uh, and my answer to people who don't like the show, people have been poaching ginseng from day one. Ever since the season was placed on it, uh, people said, well, I dug this my whole entire life. They're not telling me when I can go dig ginseng, this, this, this. Uh, and the biggest problem today isn't that a lot of people aren't respecting the uh, season. Uh, it's people that are desperate uh, for amount of reasons, uh, not just for monetary reasons because their uh, money's short, but a lot of them have drug problems. That's a new aspect of the ginseng business anymore. You have people that go out every day digging ginseng and they are not selling to the dealer, the ethical dealer. They are selling to someone who's providing that drug. They'll take that uh, ginseng as trade for their drugs. And then they gather it up, maybe, who knows, 5, 10, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, and then they shop that uh, to dealers around the area. Uh, and uh, that's the new plague on the ginseng that's happened in the past few years. It's not so much uh, teaching uh, ethical diggers that have done it their entire lives how to, to manage ginseng. It's the desperation of, uh, of some of the population uh, in the poorer sections and then the that have the drug problem. That That's the biggest thing I see, that and the uh, 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 amount of habitat uh, is decreasing because of timbering and mining. Of course, the mining, strip mining seems to be going away, but the, you know, the timber industry, some of them are doing pop wood now and they strip every tree down. It looks like your kitchen floor, you know, and ginseng can't take that, it takes shade. So they're stripping the habitat, it'll be gone for generations. Yeah. Sarah, do you have anything to add about the, the issue of coaching? You know, I think that's, those are some really great points, Tony. <laughs> and I mean, obviously you have such a, such an in-depth grasp on, on this, um, on this problem, you know, I don't know what the answer is for poaching. I certainly know that a lot of human behavior is more than likely responsible for, you know, the situation 
like he said, um, habitat loss, forestry, you know, those things are really having effects on deer populations and deer are predating and eating ginseng tops. You know, it throws everything out of whack. You know, I can't speak to poaching specifically, but I can certainly, um, you know, highlight uh, the human behavior issue when it comes to, you know, things like poaching and, you know, things like habitat loss and predation and other other threats to the ginseng, you know, as a species <laughs> at this point, or at least here where I am. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Chester, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd like to talk about, you know, when it comes to poaching, it's, uh, there's one, one thing I think a uh, problem we have is people not realizing, you know, they dig every route they come to, as opposed to knowing when to draw the line on when to dig roots. As far as poaching goes, uh, it seems like, you know, I've studied all I could on poaching, and it seems like law enforcement's hands are tied in many cases. And there's just, sometimes it seems like a hopeless thing to try to conquer. So, in short, my ideal of of curbing the poaching problem is to plant so many ginseng seeds that no amount of poachers can ever dig all that ginseng. Uh, I feel like that's, at this point, that's the most effective way to curb the poaching problem. Great, thanks. Um, so my next question will be for all three of you. And um, I was hoping that you could talk in a little bit more detail about what you do in order to promote ginseng sustainability, either through educating the public or through educating the people who you work with in your business. Um, so let's start with Chester this time. Okay, one thing I like to do is everybody I meet, I'm, I know I must be boring, but everybody I meet, I, I say, let me tell you about ginseng. Let me tell you about planting ginseng and, and about our history of ginseng. Uh, I educate them a little bit on the history and say, you know, this has been going on for hundreds of years before we were even a nation. We would like to see our hunting tradition con continue for hundreds of years in the future. And so I just try to encourage everybody I possibly can. If a, a person don't have enough money to buy some seeds, if they'll plant them, I'll give them some seeds. And of course I provide roots for people to plant. And, uh, you know, I just, and in this and in this picture, we're looking at some rows of very tightly planted ginseng seedlings. Um, these little yes. tiny plants with three leaflets each. Yes, this is some uh, one-year-olds I grew uh, to to be able to sell. And then when I, if I don't sell all the roots in a season, then I take those and to plant. And those were grown in a raised bed that I made. So uh, if I don't move all the all the ginseng plants, I take them out in the woods and plant them myself, which is a part of my uh, stewardship practices. Great. Um, and Sarah, can you can you talk a little bit about your work and about um, sort of what you're what you're promoting when you're talking about ethical harvesting? Thank you. Yeah, um, that's um, that's great. Um, so you know you have. Um, you have uh, people that are, you know, legacy, you know, it's part of their heritage. You have people from ginseng families, which is just amazing. You know, I'm not from a ginseng family. I kind of had to like learn a whole lot of this over the over years. But, you know, I still don't have that benefit or the benefit of an ecology or botany degree. And so a lot of people I feel maybe don't realize how complicated <laughs> ginseng is as a plant. I mean, you know, Tony and Chester, if you hadn't worked with ginseng all of your lives, I mean, would you ever under, you know, would you ever really know how complicated ginseng is? You know, like it's life cycle, how long it takes to make berries, how long it takes to sprout. That one gets a lot of people, you know, when they first try to start planting it. And so what I really want to do is just use outreach and education to reach also like a new generation of dealers, but a lot of people or dealers, listen to me, diggers and um, people who want to use cultivation as a method of conservation, which is another really big topic in ginseng um, conservation through cultivation. So I'm using kind of uh, my unique skills as a, as a web designer and as a graphic designer to try to 
create um, interesting and effective educational materials. So brochures, informational graphics, you know, using photography and things to help, you know, people learn because right now there's so much online. There's ginseng communities like Mr. Crane's, you know, like ginseng and granny, you know, there's media like Mr. You know, Kaufman participated in, you know, there's a whole, there's so much stuff and it seems like a whole lot of it is now online because we're losing a little bit of these, you know, these heritage diggers, you know, they're kind of, I don't want to say, you know, a dying breed, but, you know, not a lot of young people now are super interested in it. So in continuing, this is a um, educational graphic I did a few years ago. It's got a, a small ginseng root. It's kind of tan and kind of wrinkly, and it looks like two legs a little bit. And it's got this long bud scar, and the bud scar is where you can identify the age of a root. And, um, you know, like the little bud scars that go up and around up to the top here where it says bud, you know, that whole neck rhizome is really important in the field and after you dig a ginseng root to kind of age it. That's what um, diggers should be looking at before they take a plant out of the ground. It's kind of hard to do, but you're supposed to do it. And it's what dealers look at when they purchase roots because the older ginsengs are the, are the oldest roots are the most valuable, especially, um, you know, dried roots, but also with fresh roots too. Um, so um, 100 days of ginseng is like my current project trying to um, have a broad and inclusive social campaign you know, just to reach everybody because it's not just um, diggers you know who have a big influence on ginseng and its value it's also dealers and how they interact with their dealers and how they you know hopefully can educate them and promote good stewardship and ethical harvest which is kind of a new um, uh, something newer that I've been working with, trying to just set the bar, or I'm sorry, set the standard just a little higher, maybe to help people um, get a good grasp on, you know, roots that are old enough to dig. And this is a graphic that I recently updated to kind of give a definition and some of the main points, um, you know, never stop learning, observe each unique population. You know, when it comes to digging, get permission, dig in season, you know, uh, Mr. Coffin was talking about, you know, you only buy in season. That season is so important because of the seeds. And if ginseng isn't able to make seeds <laughs> to replenish its own population, then there's not going to be any left. So, um, you know, I think that's something that people take for granted a lot is they think it's just a plant. It'll grow back. You know, um, if I don't get it, then someone else will. But, um, you know, in truth, the seeds are the future and it takes two years for a seed to sprout and it takes sometimes up to 10 or more years for a ginseng seed to grow big enough to produce another seed <laughs> so that's a whole generation you know some of these you know as uh mr crane likes to say youngins out there digging roots that are older than them <laughs> so i mean i know we've all seen that you know in the in the ginseng world but um you know i just really can't overstate um, the importance of education, I think, and the future of ginseng. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for that explanation of, of ginseng stewardship. Um, Tony, um, I was wondering the degree to which you're able to communicate about good stewardship to your diggers, especially since you're working on a, a, a much larger scale um, than either Chester or Sarah. Well, the education comes uh, mostly to the kids who come in. Uh, that's that's the future of the gym sign is the the young kids uh, a few of them like I say the show uh, helped a lot of kids they saw that show and uh, actually it got families together too one's coming to mind in particular that he taught his, a guy that gym sign when he was young uh, he saw the show got interested again was looking for something for the family to do he brought uh, his daughter and his son and his wife and now they have a competition between he and his wife and the kids have competition between themselves. But those two kids are just a prime example of uh, if Jim Sain lives or dies. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I try to take the time when I when I see the kids. Uh, 
to talk to them and, and ask about, you know, get them talking about it, get them excited about it. Tell me where you dug this one, you know. Uh, the far as the planning and things, um, the one thing I'll talk about, and I've, I've argued this before, there are studies out of WVU that um, says that 70% of the seed uh, will grow, berries, I'm sorry, 70% of the berries will grow from ginseng if it's manually picked from the plant while harvesting and placed in the ground at a knuckle, you know, half of, uh, half inch, three quarters of an inch deep in cover. Uh, seventy percent grows. Less than ten percent, probably closer to three percent of the seed grows if it just falls off naturally. My and I got a little bit of a crusade on two different things. I would like to see ginseng season open up in different sections at different points of time. Like in New York State, I think their season ought to coincide when the berries are ripe, not after they're fallen. You harvest one plant and if it has five or six berries in it you'll get at least three growing back you've harvested one but you have three growing if it's planted properly uh reap seeded uh so I, I i'd like to see that in west virginia i think we should start uh august uh 15th and probably august 1st in new york and southern pa and west virginia and ohio should be august 15th to co each section and then you have the southern states virginia north carolina they're a little older you know later in the season they probably should be september 1st the more south but coincide your season with a uh, when the berries are ripe and encourage people to plant those berries not th and the more people out there planting them uh, it sounds crazy, but the more you harvest the ginseng, and if you're planting the berries from it, the more ginseng is going to sprout. It may take a few years to germinate and come back, but actually putting us in the diggers in the woods after the berries has fallen is counterproductive to me. I'd like to see that change. Another thing, I, I think that uh, I took a, a lesson from Ducks Unlimited, where they have a duck stamp, and it goes for the... Uh, conservation of the ducks well why don't we have a a, a, a licensed ginseng it could be federal it could be state pay 10 bucks i don't know one ginsigner would mind paying ten dollars for a stamp if he knew it was going to buy seed from people like chester or something uh that could uh, be a johnny Appleseed program for the ginseng uh, even if it's on state property uh even if it's protected or make it accessible uh to the digger will have a bank a seed bank where they could you know you get so many seeds for your 10 bucks or whatever combined but uh, some type of program uh, and i do hand seeds out by the way there is a uh the, you ask what else i can do a lot of dealers do this where we sell this ginseng to the chinese they lots of them have farms and they they give us seed I, i've been given garbage bags full of seed before uh where they have way more than they can plant uh, they're interested in, in uh, even though they're in the business of buying, selling, trading, doesn't mean they're not interested in the conservation of the plant that they buy, sell, and trade. They want it to see the prosper too. So uh, that's another thing that dealers can do is, is distribute some of the seed or at least give information where the digger can find it themselves. Uh, but that's a couple, three things I, I work on other than just personal touch, telling folks, you know, you need to plant and do not buy uh plants or the don't encourage them to dig those if they don't have a market for those small seedlings that they dug and they're throwing them away anyhow and i, I say you might as well take them home and eat them because i can't buy them i can't ship them that's the law uh you're just wasting them and they don't weigh anything anyhow uh other than telling them that i can't i can't go beyond that you know so but that's some things all dealers and most dealers do i'm sure great thank you so much tony um so next question is elaborating on a few phrases that we touched on earlier, um, conservation through cultivation and wild simulated ginseng, um, the role of people, you know, um, planting and tending ginseng patches themselves um, and how, you know, what that can play in terms of conservation. I'd like to start by talking with Chester because um, you know, in your business, you sell seeds and you're a forest farmer yourself. So I was hoping that you could explain a little bit more about what that means. Okay, I would, I'd like to see people going out into the wild and planting places where ginseng has never been or and or where it's been dug out completely and getting wild patches started back. I, I agree with Tony on this uh, uh, 
having to buy a license to be able to hunt ginseng. And from the proceeds of that, I'd like to add that maybe maybe classes could be taught uh, with funds from those proceeds and help to teach people good stewardship, what not to dig, uh, when to dig, and just all the different things. And then maybe even take it a step farther and say, uh, you know, you have to complete a test to see if you've learned from this class before you can get your license. I believe that that would really, really knock a big dent in keeping our, you know, just keeping our wild ginseng populations big and thick. Uh, I, I want to, one thing I'd like to see done too is like, for example, in Virginia, I can grow and sell you a root to plant that's underage, but I can only sell it to you for purposes of planting. We have states where that's not allowed at all. I feel like changes need to be made so that people in these other states will be able to do this same thing. And uh, on as far as uh, wild simulated versus wild, in Virginia, I'm not allowed to, to sell a wild simulated plant, even though I grew it, because uh, Virginia considers wild and wild simulated in the same exact category. So I feel like that needs to be changed. This would open up a lot of doors to get more people planting in more places throughout Appalachia. And it just, you know, it would really be great all around for for prospective growers and for our ginseng future. I also would like to say that, you know, one reason our Facebook group is American Gins Ginseng and Granny is because we want to see your grandchild planting. You know, we, we want to, we want to encourage, I have four grandchildren. One, my youngest one is two years old. And from the time she started talking, I've been teaching her how to say one prong, two prong, and four prong. And, you know, and, and she says, Grandad, and, for those of, and for those of you who are listening who don't know what that means, it refers to the number of leaves that show up on a ginseng plant. And in general, the more prongs it has, the older it is. There are right. there's some variation there, but just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, if you're not familiar with ginseng. Sorry, Chester, I didn't mean to interrupt. No problem. I'm glad you explained that because I probably <laughs> wouldn't have thought of it. But uh, you know, we we just want to get everybody encouraged to, to plant. We we want your your grandchild's first words to be ginseng, and uh, you know, I wanted to. I had a testimonial just a while back and I had done, done a video and when I do a video or when I do a post, a lot of times I say woohoo at the end as, you know, to express excitement. And so I got a private message from uh, one of our uh, group members who said that uh, their grandson just loved hearing me say woohoo and he went around hollering woohoo all day. So it was <laughs> just really heartwarming to know that I've touched a little, a little child and, and I believe that that this little child will turn into a grown man and, and he'll probably do, maybe do miracles for our ginseng in the future. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Chester. Um, Sarah or Tony, do you have anything to add about wild simulated or cultivated ginseng? Sarah? Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, so my, my three-year-old son, Griffin, I think one of the first plants he ever learned was ginseng. And he knew it from the red berries, which is a really great example for everybody. Plant the seeds, plant the seeds, look for the berries. But um, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> wild ginseng has had a market for thousands of years, thousands of years in Asia. Um, like specifically China, Korea, you know, places like that. And definitely, you know, way longer there than, you know, in North America, you know, it was used as an herb by uh, the First Nation people um, of this country. And, uh, you know, um, it's not gonna go away. And I don't know if it should, you know, uh, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. I believe everybody can agree on that, but, um, you know, hopefully, you know, conservation through cultivation can help relieve some pressure on the wild populations. And, you know, like I said, wild ginseng is never going to go away. So there has to be a lot of work done, you know, when it comes to legislation, when it comes to education, 
when it comes to, you know, outreach to the people, you know, like uh, Tony said, who are really in need of, um, you know, financial help or, you know, medical care, um, you know, um, so yeah, maybe, maybe conservation through cultivation can be a seed bank. Maybe it can be an idea bank. Maybe it could also provide, you know, assistance in other ways, maybe even like organizations and financial support for, you know, doing research on wild um, ginseng, citizen science and things like that, which might be able to help preserve it. But it is very important, um, you know, especially for people who are landowners. So yeah, extremely important. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much. Um, so this might be the last serious question that we have, um, but I was hoping that some of you could address some of the biggest misconceptions or false ideas about ginseng that you often come across people having. Um, so let's start with you this time, Tony. Wow, I wish you would start with somebody else. That's a I <laughs> misconception. <laughs> I deal uh, mostly with professional ginseng takers, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Uh, they have few misconceptions uh, about the ginseng, other than, um, you know, uh, I think the misconception, The I've gone through several generations, over 40 years. I have my grandfather's customers who were born in the late 1800s. Uh, I have my own now, and I'm down uh, people from born from 1890s to uh, year 2010, <laughs> you know, my customer range is. Uh, so, and misconceptions is, uh, they think maybe that the, the green gen sign that we're buying, I guess one question is, is that we're selling it to be replanted in Asia to replenish their crop and uh, uh, they're afraid to sell it green. Uh, you know, they think that they're replanting, killing their own market. And that's about the only misconception of oh, we're actually selling it to sell here. Mm -hmm. Sarah? Um, those are some great points, Tony. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, for me in spending a whole lot of time thinking about this and boiling it down to maybe like the root <laughs> of the problem is that people think it's just a plant. It's just a plant, it'll grow back. It, you know, how is it unlike a daisy or a tomato, you know? And, you know, another thing is, you know, oh, it's just this dollar bill sticking up out of the ground in the woods. And, um, you know, those misconceptions, I feel like, I mean, I've heard, um, you know, I feel like those can be easily addressed with some education and um, you know, out, outreach in the way that, you know, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, this is um, a, another educational graphic that I did about how to, determine, how to determine the age of wild ginseng roots. And the age is the key. The age is the key to it being able to produce berries and seeds. Age is the key to value when it comes for, you know, when it comes to what dealers are, are wanting and, you know, their buyers are wanting. That's the true value of ginseng is the age. And so, um, you know, just being able to teach people about how long it takes, how complicated ginseng is as a species, as a plant, you know, um, maybe may, perhaps can help those who are interested in, you know, having ginseng in the future. So, Great. yeah. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, it's getting very close for us to start wrapping up, but um, Chester and Sarah, you both have some great ginseng t-shirts. And I was hoping that you could both stand up and just explain really briefly what it is is that's on your shirt right there, just so the audience can see. Chester, <laughs> Granny's ginseng. Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, our Granny's ginseng t-shirt. The picture on it is of a plant. Uh, we named Big Daddy. And the reason I named him that is because, ironically, when I found this wild plant, he had 16 children. And, of course, uh, I have 15 brothers and sisters, so we related uh, with this ginseng plant. Great. Thanks so much, Chester. And can you show us your shirt, Sarah? Yeah, sure. It's called, uh, it's called this project is called 100 Days of Ginseng Stewardship Countdown 2020. And what that is, it's a um, it's a countdown to ginseng season. 
And every day, or almost every day, I've been trying to be able to produce, um, you know, like an interesting little factoid about the history or, um, you know, like biology or the habitat or the value of ginseng roots in, in, in order to get everybody kind of excited about being good stewards and, you know, ethically harvesting and planting every seed, planting every seed. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, it's about time for us to start wrapping up. And so thank you so much to our guest speakers, Tony Kaufman, Sarah Jackson, and Chester Crane. And also thank you to the audience for participating, um, everybody who's watching and listening and commenting. Um, I want to close by offering thanks to the Folklife Festival, <clears throat> entire team of staff and interns and volunteers, especially thank you to Elisa Huff, Sarah Rothman, Jimmy Maycock, Diane Nutting for their work, and my sincere thanks also to Betty Belanus, Arlene Reininger, and Justin Sisk, who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make all of this possible. Follow the Smithsonian Folklife Festival page here on Facebook and YouTube to get notifications about future events, and find us also on Instagram at Smithsonian Folklife. Visit our website and come back here for our next program. Thank you for having us. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. We're looking forward.